Welcome back. It was a crime which pushed everything else off the front pages. Three men, all known criminals, found shot dead in the Essex countryside. It was a cold-blooded professional killing. The victims had many enemies, but which one wanted them executed? And welcome back to a new video on the Essex Boys case. As always, if you are enjoying the content, please do give the video a thumbs up. And if you're interested in the Essex Boys case or simply true crime in general, don't forget to hit the subscribe button below. A Billericay man charged with robbery was remanded in custody by Billericay magistrates, but a woman facing the same charge was released on conditional bail. Patrick Tate, 30, and Sarah Saunders, 20, of Selworthy Close Billericay, are accused of robbery at the Happy Eater restaurant in Langdon on December the 18th. Saunders was released on the conditions that she lived with her parents. Reports to Basildon Police Station daily, does not interfere with any witnesses or visit the Happy Eater, and does not go within one mile of Billericay except to visit her solicitor and the court, and that her mother provide a surety of £10,000. Saunders will appear in court again on February the 2nd, and Tate is due to appear on December 29th. The following newspaper article is from the 30th of December 1988, with the headline, Dangerous Prisoner Escapes Courthouse. This man is on the loose and could be dangerous. If you see him, do not approach him, but report straight to your local police station. He is 30-year-old Patrick Tate, who yesterday made a dramatic escape from the dock of Billericay Court, where he was accused of robbery and possession of cocaine. Three police officers were injured as bodybuilder Tate of Selworthy Close Billericay powered his way out of the court to a waiting motorcycle. One WPC received a black eye and another officer was kicked in the face as police tried to block Tate's escape. But a Basildon police spokesman today said he believed witnesses inside the court tried to impede the police attempts to restrain Tate. Roadblocks, which were imminently set up, failed to trap Tate and police said they could not give a description of the motorcycle or say whether there was more than one person on the high-powered bike. Tate is 6 foot 2, broad build between 16 and 18 stone, and had various tattoos. He was wearing a fawn top, a green sweatshirt, and light blue jeans. By October 1995, Mick Steele had two successful drug runs under his belt and had earned around £50,000 in smuggling fees alone. It was time to start enjoying the spoils of his life of crime. He had spotted a dilapidated bungalow on the outskirts of Clacton called Meadow Cottage, which was in a prime location but in appalling condition. It needed rewiring, new plumbing, new ceilings, new plastering, the lot. It was perfect. The price was low enough for Steele to get a mortgage based purely on the income from his building business MJS Trading without arousing any suspicion. And once there, Steele could happily spend as much as he wanted, turning it into his dream home. The total price was £80,000. Still put down £20,000 in cash and took out a loan for the rest. The bungalow was empty. The previous owner had been shipped off to a nursing home, so once contracts were exchanged, he began spending more and more time there, planning the changes he wanted to make and getting quotes from various workmen. Having lost virtually everything just a few years earlier, everything was starting to fall back into place. Michael Steele was back on the rise. Elsewhere in the country, another Essex villain was also celebrating a return to form. Nearly a year after being sent back to prison for smuggling the gun into hospital, Pat Tate was out and lighting up the town with a massive round of wild parties and drug benders. The biggest of the celebrations took place at Tucker's brand new mansion in Fobbing. Going under the name Brine Mount Lodge, the £250,000 luxury hacienda-style bungalow came complete with stunning views of the countryside and stables. In the front garden, there was a full-size statue of a naked goddess, and six feet high Greek urns adorned the wall. In the garage block, Tucker kept his Porsche and the brand new Mercedes that he had bought to replace the Jaguar. The property had electronic security gates, a sophisticated video intercom system, and was even patrolled by guard dogs at night. And Tucker had bought the lot for cash. The day of the party started off in the highest of spirits, 
One of the many pictures taken shows Pat Tate, Mick Steele and Jackie Street all together. Tate has an enormous smile on his face and looks relaxed in an open neck denim shirt. Steele is standing with his hand on his hip and is also grinning broadly. Between the two huge men, looking like a little ragdoll, is Jackie Street, kicking one of her legs up like a tiller girl. Soon after the picture was taken, Steele took Tate to one side to discuss business. Steele explained that he was planning another drugs run in a couple of weeks' time and wanted to offer Tate the chance to buy into it. Tate asked how much Steele would charge for importing and then balked at the £330 per kilo price, saying it was way too much. It would leave him with little profit from selling the drugs over here. Steele calmly explained that with his way of smuggling, there was virtually no risk. The chances of a customs patrol boat coming across his little rib on the way back from Blankenberg were less than zero. He should know, he'd done it a thousand times. Sure, it might be cheaper to pay some bozo to pile it in his boot and drive it through customs, but what with the sniffer dogs, x-rays and the like, there was at least a 1 in 10 chance of getting pulled. It would be a false economy. Eventually, the pair agreed on a price of £300 per kilo, and Tate promised to get some money to steal in the next few days. What Tate had failed to let on, however, was that he didn't actually have any money. Having just got out, he needed most of what he had stashed away to buy himself a car, pay a few bills, and support the flashy lifestyle he was now living. Tucker had given him control of a couple of clubs, but the profits from those would take time to arrive. The sensible thing to do was to pull out of the deal and wait. But Tate wasn't about to start being sensible. In fact, since getting out of prison, he had been getting increasingly out of control and paranoid. He began to fear that he was being left behind by Tucker and Rolf. The two of them had killed Whitaker in his absence and had set up profitable deals of their own. Tucker, in particular with his house, cars and horses, seemed to be raking it in. Even Rolf was doing well, having paid £80,000 cash for Tucker's old attached house in Chafford 100. And while Tucker had offered Tate a place in his organisation, Tate knew this was more down to friendship than anything else. Tate wanted to prove himself every bit as good as the others, and the money he could make out of the deal with Steele could be a great start. So rather than wait and miss out, Tate decided to take advantage of the friendships he had made in prison. We had become great pals with the likes of a well-known cop killer, two brothers from an Essex family known as the Joneses, whose names have been changed, who always had plenty of ready cash knocking about, and Ronnie Knight. The Joneses are the sort of villains whom even hardened members of the criminal underworld go out of their way to avoid. Totally ruthless, fearless and efficient, the fact that few people have heard of them or their dominance of towns like Romford is testament to the power they wield. When Tate approached them, he made an offer they simply wouldn't be able to resist. Basically, if they lent him £40,000 for two weeks, he'd give them £50,000 back. Guaranteed. No one wants to look a gift horse in the mouth. The answer had to be yes. Hands were shaken, the money was duly handed over, and that was that. Tate was back in business. The parties continued, and so did the drug binges. Everyone goes a bit crazy when they get out of prison, living life to the fullest and all that. But Tate was taking it to the limit, and then some. It got to the stage where Tate himself was no longer calling the tune. The drugs were. Halfway through his official getting out bash at a snooker hall in Dagenham, a few days after the deal with Steele had been struck, Tate ran out of cocaine. He decided that he needed more, and knowing he had plenty stashed near his home, he asked one of the guests to drive him over to his place. The man had been drinking heavily and knew he was in no fit state to be behind the wheel of a car, so he refused. It was the wrong answer. Tate pulled the man to one side and pulled a gun on him. Get in your fucking car and drive me back to my fucking house, otherwise I'll kill you. The man reluctantly agreed. Half an hour or so later, mission accomplished. The pair returned to the party. Tate got out of the car and made his way back to the door, before noticing that the man who had just driven him home was following close behind. Where the fuck do you think you're going? said Tate. You ain't coming back in here. Fuck off. Go on, fuck off or I'll shoot you. Sarah Saunders had been Pat Tate's lover for more than six years, but during all that time the couple were only actually together for a year and a half. I saw a side of Pat that nobody else saw. I was really in love with him. He had a terrific personality, but he was always in prison. Sarah had been there when Tate had robbed a happy eater in Basildon. She had been there, along with his then wife, when he jumped the dock at Billy Ricky Magistrates Court to make his bid for freedom. She had been there when he was captured and sentenced to 10 years for robbery and drugs offences. 
She had even been there when Tate had been shot for the first time. The pair had a son, conceived while Tate was on day release from Hollersley Bay, but despite Tate doting on his child and providing for Sarah whenever he was away, the strain of the separation eventually proved too much. When he got out of prison for the last time, we would just row a lot. He started taking lots more drugs and it was really affecting his personality. He wasn't the same bloke I'd fallen in love with. I hardly recognised him. Sarah had been wanting to leave for some time, but was too scared and felt she had nowhere to go. The situation continued to deteriorate and finally reached rock bottom soon after the Dagenham party. After a furious argument, Tate stormed out and told her that it was all over. She was no longer welcome in his house and had better not be there when he got back. In desperation, Sarah called the boyfriend of a close friend of hers who lived a few streets away. He turned up in his car and helped Sarah grab a few things and took her to stay with them that night. The following morning, there was only one person Sarah wanted to call. Mick Steele. While Tate had been in prison, the person he trusted most with his money was Michael Steele. Tate had put him in charge of around £23,000 and given him strict instructions to dish it out to Sarah as and when it was needed to pay bills or buy things for their child. The pair had got to know each other while Steele was in prison and she had also become very pally with Jackie Street. As the months went by, so the friendship between Steele and Saunders developed. As soon as he heard the news about her being kicked out, Steele began to help her to set up a new home. Darren Nichol states, I was trying my hand at running a business repairing and selling fridges and freezers. Mick called me up and asked me how much it would be to replace the fridge in Sarah's new house because the one she had wasn't working. Depending on how much it was, he was going to buy it for her, but he told me not to tell Jackie that he was paying for it as she wouldn't like it if she thought he was spending their money on someone else. I told him it was best if I come round and have a look at it because I might be able to get it working. Jackie Street picked me up in her RAV4 and we met Mick and we went over to Sarah's place. It didn't take long to work out what the problem was. The fridge had been plugged into the cooker socket, so every time Sarah turned off the cooker, she turned off the fridge as well. It was around lunchtime and a couple of friends of Sarah's turned up to cheer her up with some bottles of wine. So we all sat about in the living room chatting about Pat. The whole conversation revolved around just how bad he was, how out of control he'd become and how much he had changed. It turned out that when Pat found out that her friend's boyfriend was helping Sarah move out, he went completely mad. Even though he had actually told her to leave, he somehow blamed this bloke for splitting the two of them up. Along with Tucker and Rolf, they went to track the bloke down. They basically kidnapped him off the streets and took him back to Pat's house, when they held a knife to his throat and told him to snort six lines of coke. He tried to say no, but they made it pretty obvious that if he didn't do as they said, they would hurt him really bad. So he started snorting, and they made him snort more and more and more, until basically the guy passed out. Once he was unconscious, they stripped all his clothes off and started putting out cigarettes all over his body until he came round. Then they made him snort more coke until he passed out, then they burned him again until he came round again. After a while, Tucker and Rolf were getting bored and said they thought the bloke had had enough, but Tate wasn't having it. He was like a man possessed. He just kept waking the bloke up and making him snort more and more until eventually they ran out of drugs. Then Tate chucked the bloke in the boot of his car and dumped him in the front garden of his house. When the bloke's girlfriend came home, she found him rolling around naked in the living room, covered in burns and gasping for air. He'd had so much powder up his nostrils that he couldn't breathe through them. He had no idea what was going on or who he was. He was in a right old state, just crying constantly. They'd really broken him. He ended up in a psychiatric unit for three days, and when he got out, surprise, surprise, he decided not to press charges. Sarah was upset by the whole thing, but I was surprised to see that Mick was almost in tears himself. He kept saying that he just couldn't believe how someone he had once considered such a good friend had changed so much. He'd get more and more angry every time Sarah mentioned something new that Pat had done to her. He seemed to be taking it really personally. Eventually, he walked over to Sarah and gave her a big hug. It was a whole new side of him. I would describe my relationship with Pat as friendly, although we did not socialise outside of work. It was around this time that Pat started talking about a man called Tony Tucker, who he said he had met at a nightclub where Tony was working as a doorman. I had never met Tony, but I can remember Pat talking about him. It was around this time that I was told that Pat had been shot and he was in Basildon Hospital. I went to the hospital with Graham Law to see Pat, and when I was there, Pat's brother Russell turned up. Although I had known Russell as a car trader, I've had very little to do with him. We only stayed with Pat for around 10 minutes, as I merely wanted to let him know that I had heard and passed on my good wishes. Although I had this regular contact with Pat and we had built up a trust between us, 
He never told me any details of what he was involved in other than to do with cars. He knew I'd previously been in the Metropolitan Police Service for a short period and I was also wary of Pat with his volatile temperament. I was always careful of what I asked Pat in case he thought I was trying to get information from him. I was later told that the man I had met at Pat's party, Stephen Ellis, was possibly involved in the shooting, although I do not know whether there is any truth in this. I have never asked Pat about the shooting or his other businesses, as I know he would be suspicious of my reasons. I later became aware that the police had found a number of items in Pat's possession at hospital, and as a result he was returned to prison. I believe the items included a handgun, a quantity of cocaine and some tablets. I did not go and see Pat in prison, but I was asked by Pat through Sarah Saunders to dispose of his current vehicle, which was a black 928S2 Porsche, index AN0928S. I took possession of the vehicle from Sarah, and after having some work done on it, I put it up for sale on my front for around £8,995. When I had the car, I received a phone call from Pat in prison telling me to keep the money if I sold the car and not give it to Sarah or anyone else. I had the vehicle for a couple of months and during this time I took two deposits on the car but the sales fell through. When I took the deposits I used to put a sold sign on the vehicle and when I did this I received a visit from the man called Tony Tucker. At this time I think I'd met Tucker once or twice when he had attended the car front with Pat before he was returned to prison. When he came to my garage, Tucker told me to give him the money. Although I had heard about Tony Tucker and I did not want to cross him, I was more concerned about crossing Pat, and therefore I told Tony that I would not give him the money. When I stood my ground and I told him what Pat had said, Tony seemed to accept it and left my garage. I kept the car for a couple of months but could not sell it. I therefore returned it to Sarah Saunders. In this time I only saw Tony Tucker once more when he came up to my car front on a horse and asked me if I had any luck selling it. At this time I had become aware of Tony moving into a house in Fobbing High Road with a large plot of land. I had a couple of phone calls from Pat whilst he was in prison, but they appeared to be merely for a chat rather than anything specific. The next time I saw Pat was when he came down to my car front after he'd been released from prison. This would have been at the end of October 95, beginning of November 95. I believe at this time he was on his own and we had a general chat about domestic and general matters. At this time he appeared quite level-headed and normal. My next contact with Pat and Tony Tucker was when they came to my garage after Pat had had an accident in Tony's black Porsche. The vehicle was badly damaged and Pat was asking me to sort it out as cheaply as possible. The vehicle was brought to the One Tree Hill site and my daughter spent a lot of time trying to locate cheap second-hand spares for the repair. I also arranged for quotes to carry out the bodywork. As a result of the Porsche repairs, I began to have virtual day-to-day -day contact with either Pat, Tony or both. The majority of the time they were together and were accompanied by a younger man called Craig. At that time I had a blue Range Rover 3.5 Vogue SE, index F424NPE on my forecourt as I'd recently taken that in as part exchange. I had purchased this vehicle from a Mr Graham Hurston of Kingston Road, Stanford La Hope on the 2nd of the 11th, 95. I can produce a copy of the purchase invoice for this transaction as my exhibit BTD-1. As Tony Tucker was now without a vehicle, he and Pat showed interest in purchasing the Range Rover which I had for sale at £10,995. After some negotiation, I agreed to sell it to them for £9,800 but I knew that neither Pat or Tony would be able to get finance on the vehicle. When I pointed this out, Tony stated that his friend would be buying it on his behalf but he would be using it. I agreed to accept a £2,000 deposit and put the remainder on finance. A friend of Tony's, a man who gave his name as Mr P Cuthbert of Templewood Road, Hadley, Essex, then attended my site and provided sufficient details for me to complete the finance agreement. I was handed £2,000 in cash and at this time I'm unable to say which one of them gave it to me. They then took the keys from me and drove the vehicle away from my forecourt. I completed a sales invoice for the transaction and showed the purchaser as Tony Tucker. I can produce a copy of this invoice as my exhibit BTD-2. I then sent off the completed finance agreement and received my cheque from the company for the balance. I am still in possession of the registration document for the vehicle which I can produce as exhibit BTD-3. The finance company would have issued a paying in book to Mr P Cuthbert to enable the monthly payments to be made. This book would have been sent to Cuthbert's home address. 
The Range Rover was taken by Pat and Tony on the 14th of the 11th, 95. From that day when Pat, Tony and Craig visited my car front, they would be using the Range Rover. Craig would normally be the driver with Pat in the front passenger seat and Tony in the back. As stated, I had a number of visits from them inquiring about the progress with the Porsche repairs. I can remember during one of their visits, Tony was really annoyed and stated that they were trying to link him to the supply of the ecstasy tablet which killed the girl called Leah Betts. He stated that he knew who had supplied it as he had been told by one of the doormen. He also stated that he had made some checks and he knew that the girl regularly took tablets and that she didn't even live with her father. He was really ranting and raving to Pat about it and I heard him say that it was only because her dad was a policeman that such a fuss was being made. During the morning of Wednesday the 6th of the 12th, 95, I was at the car front when Pat, Tony, Craig and Mr P Cuthbert arrived in the Range Rover. I would describe Cuthbert as a male, white, 5'10 to 5'11, late 30s, reasonably fit build. I have been told that he is a ceiling fixer. The four of them came into the office and I was handed by one of them the paying in book relating to the Range Rover finance and between them they produced £321.40 and in cash. I was asked by one of them, I can't remember who, to keep the book and remind them when the payments were due. I agreed to do this as it was in my interest to make sure the finance was paid. I would also been told by Pat and Tony at the time of purchasing the vehicle that they intended to pay it off in one lump sum fairly quickly. I paid this sum into the Barclays Bank at Pitsy Broadway the following day. Sometime during an earlier meet with Pat, he had asked me whether I had a suitable vehicle for him to give to Sarah Saunders. He told me there had been a lot of problems between them and he wanted to give her a car to get her off his back. I told him I had a VW Passat on the forecourt which I had taken in as part exchange on the 25th of the 11th, 95. I showed him the vehicle which was metallic green in colour and had the registration number F120GGF. He agreed to take it for a test drive and later we agreed on a price of £1,800 for the vehicle. I can produce a purchase invoice for this VW Passat as my exhibit BTD-5. I left my garage forecourt around 1700 to 1730 on Wednesday the 6th of December 1995, intending to play my friend Keith Moore at squash. At this time my daughter and an employee Mickey Stenning were at the car front. En route to squash I received a phone call from Mickey Stenning stating that Herc, which is my pet name for Pat Tate due to his size, had arrived at the car front to collect the VW Passat. Pat then came onto the phone and told me that he would still take the vehicle even though he didn't need it as he had a bust up with Sarah Saunders. I told him he didn't have to take it but he insisted that he would. He told me that he would pay for the vehicle in the morning as he had a lump of money coming. As a result I agreed to Pat taking the vehicle that night which he did. The following morning, Thursday the 7th of December 95, I returned to my car site at around 9am. Between 11 and 12 midday, I was at the site talking to a customer when a female approached me and called me by name. I did not recognise her and as I was talking she appeared to move away. A short while later I returned to my office and the same woman approached me and said words to the effect of, Bow, can they trace the Range Rover back to you? Not knowing her I said, what Range Rover? And she replied, the one that Tony's been using. At that I realised that she was referring to the Range Rover being used by Pat Tate and Tony Tucker. I asked her why and she just replied, oh nothing. She then walked out of the office. I would describe this woman as female, white, 5 foot 3, slim build, tanned freckled face with mousy straight hair. I believe that she is the girlfriend of Tony Tucker. I was obviously concerned about why she had come in and asked that question so I immediately tried to contact Pat Tate on his mobile telephone. When I called the number 0585429316 I got no reply so I tried his other mobile number. When this was answered it was by a female who I did not recognise. I asked to speak to the big man and she said he was out on a job. I asked if everything was alright and she just said yeah. I then tried to phone Tony on his mobile but all I got was Tony's answer phone. I did not leave a message. I then tried to phone Tony's home phone but that was unobtainable. I have not seen Tony Tucker, Pat Tate, Craig or Mr Cuthbert since. Purely as background information, I am aware that Pat, Tony and Craig were heavily into bodybuilding and in their quest to increase their size were injecting substances. I believe that all three of them used a progress gym for an hour each morning. Okay, so obviously a very detailed statement there. Now, 
I think Barry's always come across incredibly well in the documentaries that I've seen. I've never spoken to the guy personally, but when I listen to parts of the documentary, especially the Truth documentary, he always comes across incredibly well. He's obviously someone that knew Pat Tate for a lot of years, and this statement is incredibly interesting. Particularly the parts where Pat is in prison, he calls up Barry and says, look, if you sell this Porsche, please keep the money. I don't want it going to Sarah. I don't want it to go into anybody. I need you to keep hold of this money until I get out. Now, at some stage, this Porsche has had a deposit put down on it. Tucker has obviously driven past and seen the sold sign on this Porsche and gone in to see Barry to collect the money. Now, this all ties in with a level of mistrust here between Tucker and Tate. The more I read these statements, the more I read into this, the more I can see that the cracks are appearing. Tate has obviously felt concerned, or maybe it's just simply paranoia, but he's calling up his good friend there to say, look, don't let anybody touch this money. No one, not Tony, not Craig, not Sarah, not anybody. And what's Tony done? He's seen that that car's sold, and the first thing that he's done is rock up at the car front and demanded the money off of Barry. It does make you wonder exactly what their relationship was like towards the end of their lives. Also remember that shortly after this period, or around this period I should say, Tony Tucker turns up with this massive house in Fobbing. Okay, so let's just stop very briefly and just clarify what we've got here because this is not an isolated incident. Now, Pat Tate is recalled to prison after being in hospital and being found with the handgun in his bedclothes. He's returned to prison and during his spell in prison, he gives full financial control of his finances over to Tony Tucker. It's during this time period that it's Tony Tucker's responsibility to pay Sarah Saunders a set amount of money each month. Now, sometime during that spell in prison, Pat Tate has a change of heart. He contacts Michael Steele and says to Michael Steele, look, I'm not happy about Tony Tucker dealing with my finances. I'm not happy with what he's spending the money on. Can you take full financial control from him? And I want you, Michael Steele, to pay Sarah Saunders a certain amount of money each month. Now, this version of events came from Michael Steele, but it was also fully backed up in Sarah Saunders' police interview. It's also backed up in terms of this statement here. The fact that Tate was in prison, he said, look, I want you to keep all the money for when I get out. I don't want you to give it to anybody. And then Tony's come along and tried to take that money from Barry Dorman. What we also had was a statement from Donna Garwood's brother, Donna Garwood being the then girlfriend of Tony Tucker. Her brother said in his statement that actually Tony had said to her that he was concerned about something that Pat had done, which reflected badly on him. He was quite paranoid, he was staying in more, he was quite jumpy. And these three statements from three separate individuals are telling a very similar story. There's a level here of distrust between Tate and Tucker in November, December 1995. Now, what is important to cover in this video is also Tate's real demeanour on December the 6th. It's quite interesting when we look at the early parts of December the 6th when Tucker, Tate, Rolf and Cuthbert approach the car front to pay off the finance agreement, it's almost like the three of them are scrambling around to come up with £300. Yet later on in the evening when Tate is talking to Dorman about buying this VW, he's almost quite carefree. He says to Dorman, look, I don't need the car anymore. Um, I've fallen out with Sarah again, but don't worry, I'm still going to buy it. I'm coming into a load of money. I'll be back in the morning to pay it off. The mention of coming into money is also spoken about by Barry Dorman in this following passage, where he states the following. I'd also been told by Pat and Tony at the time of purchasing the Range Rover that they intended to pay it off in one lump sum fairly quickly. Now, in my opinion, December the 6th is the day of the deal. It's the day that Tate thinks he's going to come into some money. Now, what doesn't make any sense is the fact that the call at 2.30pm to Tucker's mobile is supposedly the one where they say, look, there's been a delay, there's snow on the ground, but we're going to take a look at where the plane's going to land in the future. Tate, in my mind, believes he's coming into money on December the 6th. This isn't a dry run. This isn't somewhere they're going to look at something that's going to be happening in a week's time. Tate is telling Dorman in this very statement, he'll be back tomorrow with two grand to pay off this car that he doesn't even need. In my opinion, Tate feels like he's coming into hundreds of thousands of pounds, not maybe 10 or 20 grand, but hundreds of thousands. Now put yourself in Tate's position for one moment. If you'd had that phone call, you'd heard from Tucker at 2.30 p.m. that there'd been a delay, that there was snow on the ground, they wouldn't be receiving the money as quickly as they thought they would. 
that a deal had been put off for a few days. Would you really be speaking to someone at half past five, having been armed with that information, and then be telling them, look, don't worry, I'm coming into a lump of cash. I'll be back in the morning to pay off the two grand. I don't need the car, falling out of Sarah again, but I'm still gonna take it off you. I've messed you about. I'll give you two grand, it's not a problem. Would you really be doing that? In my mind, as I've just said, Tate was convinced that he was coming into money on December the 6th. Now, just to go over again what is said in that statement here, it states the following. En route to squash, I received a phone call from Mickey Stenning stating that Herc, which was my pet name for Pat Tate due to his size, had arrived at the car front to collect the VW Passat. Pat then came onto the phone and told me that he would still take the vehicle even though he didn't need it, as he'd had a bust up with Sarah Saunders. I told him that he didn't need to take it, but he insisted that he would. He told me that he would pay for the vehicle in the morning, as he had a lump of money coming. As a result, I agreed to Pat taking the vehicle that night, which he did. It just doesn't make any sense. The whole notion of this murder, the fact that Steele is showing them where this lane is, he's going to show them where this plane's going to land. These people think they're coming into money this night. I'm sure of it. That's why they've got this meal booked. Why would you be having the meal for a, a, a pre-celebration for money you haven't even received yet? The absolute notion of that is just ridiculous. In my opinion, they thought they were going to have the deal that night. There was some sort of deal going to take place and they thought they were going to hit the big time on December the 6th. Now, when you take a look at this from a different angle, it also ties in with Darren Nichols' original version of events for Mickey Steele going to meet Pat Tate for a deal. Now, what doesn't make any sense is why these three individuals, as in Tucker, Tate and Rolf, why these three individuals would travel down that lane unarmed. Now, obviously, we have no way of telling for certain if they were armed or not, but it's more than likely the case that they weren't. So why would they be down that lane? We know there's a gun range there. Could they have been lured down there on the pretense of buying weaponry for a later armed robbery that was going to take place after the meal? I don't know. But one thing is for certain is that I'm getting the impression here that Tate was convinced, absolutely convinced, that he was coming into a great sum of money on December the 6th. Now, from here, we move on to the murders themselves. It was at 1844 where Sarah Saunders calls Pat Tate and they have a phone call which lasts almost four minutes in duration. Now, this isn't the impression we get when we take a look at Sarah Saunders' police statement, where she claims that the telephone call was actually very brief, that she just spoke to Pat and he said, I can't really speak at the moment, I'm with some people. But he seemed quite relaxed, quite upbeat, quite jovial. And he said he would get in contact with Sarah Saunders the following day. Now, what Sarah herself found quite strange about that phone call is that if he was with Michael Steele, she can't understand why Pat wouldn't have simply said, I'm with Mickey and the boys at the moment, I'll call you back tomorrow. Because that wasn't what Pat Tate actually said. His words were to the effect of, I can't talk at the moment, I'm with some people, everything's fine, I'll give you a call back tomorrow and we'll sort it out. Anyway, what is most important about this telephone call, other than the content of the call itself, is the fact that the official narrative, the official version of events for these murders as put forward by the prosecution, was that the Range Rover entered the lane shortly before 7 p.m. It traveled down the cold, dark, lonely farm track. It reached the five bar locked gate. Craig Rolf pulled up to the gate and the rear passenger said, just wait there, I'm gonna open the gate. He got out the back and then Jack Wombs appeared from nearby bushes and executed the three men. Now, this is where things start to get a little bit more confusing. As in Darren Nichols' official testimony, he claims that he has a conversation with Michael Steele after these murders, where Michael Steele tells him that they are travelling down the lane in question when Pat Tate's phone springs to life. His phone starts to ring, and it's Sarah Saunders at the other end of the call. Steele remarks at being rather paranoid and concerned that Tate's going to mention that he's with Steele in the vehicle, but luckily he doesn't. He remarks to Darren that it was lucky that he didn't stay on with Mickey at the moment because he didn't know how he'd stop Jack Wombs from executing the three men. Now, we know that this can't be true because the call lasts almost four minutes in duration. So the actual distance from the start of the lane to the lock gate is no more than a 10 or 15 second drive. So clearly what has happened here is that either this call originated way before they got to the lane in question or they were waiting down the lane for a few minutes before being executed. Now, what is quite annoying is that we have a very rudimentary mistake by the investigating officer interviewing Sarah Saunders as he fails to ask her if she believed that the vehicle was moving at the time of the phone call. 
He didn't say to Sarah, did it sound like they were moving? Did they sound like they were in a car? Did he sound like he was with other people? Could you hear noise in the background? None of these questions were put to Sarah Saunders. So we have no idea if the Range Rover was in transit at this time or stationary. Now to conclude this video, I'm going to leave you with a statement which you may not have heard before. This is from a lady by the name of Susan Kerry, who was the mother of one of Pat Tate's girlfriends. She was one of the last people to speak to Pat Tate before his murder. The following statement is from Susan Carey, dated the 6th of February 1996. I live with my family in the Eastwood area. I have four daughters, the youngest of whom is Claire. Claire is 23 years old. On and off, Claire lives at home but spends time with her boyfriend. At present, Claire works at TGI Fridays at the Lakeside Complex in West Farrock. However, she had previously worked in South End at a restaurant called Cellars, and I believe that a Kim Webber was the owner. It was through Claire's association with the restaurant and Kim that she became acquainted with Pat Tate. My first impression of Pat was only from what Claire had told me, and I first became aware of Claire actually seeing Pat when he was in hospital having been shot in the arm. I'd only ever met Pat once when he came to the door at my house calling for Claire. I was aware that Pat also served some time in prison and that he would keep in contact with Claire when he got out. It was only a couple of months ago when he must have been released because I started getting phone calls from Pat. He would be very polite and ask for Claire and more often than not she wasn't in, so he would apologise for troubling me and ask that I leave a message for Claire to contact him. I approached Claire and at one stage voiced my concern because I didn't really want my daughter getting involved with him because of his past. Claire assured me that she wasn't. The last time I had any contact with Pat Tate was on Wednesday the 6th of December 1995 when he phoned me at home at around 6pm. He had rung several times earlier in the day asking for Claire and on the final occasion Claire still wasn't back from work. It was then that Pat said that he had to go out for around half an hour but asked that I tell Claire to hang on as he would be back. Pat didn't sound concerned or worried on the phone. The only other contact I had was later that evening from Claire herself, saying that she'd been waiting outside Pat's for ages and he hadn't turned up, so she was going to go back to her boyfriend's. When Pat last rang, he sounded like he was at home because he said, please tell her to hold on. He explained that he was thinking about leaving a note on his door for Claire, but didn't know whether he would bother. Whenever Pat rang up, he would always introduce himself as Pat Tate. I had no doubts that it was not him. One of the more common questions that I've been asked over the past couple of years surrounding the Essex boys' murders seems to focus on the drugs which were found in Pat Tate's bloodstream. Some people believe he was overdosed intentionally and others just believe that they were heavy drug users. In this video we're going to take a look at some of the evidence which could support either claim and first we're going to start with a newspaper article from The Guardian which was dated the 7th of the 3rd 96 with the title The Hit which describes what was found in Pat Tate's bloodstream. It's in this newspaper article that it states the following. They died in under two seconds, and only one, Tate, seemed to know anything about it. How much, as almost everything in this case, is conjecture. A post-mortem examination highlighted a combination in his bloodstream of heroin, cocaine, cannabis and steroids. Now when I first posed that question to myself, I guess I just thought it was a little bit outlandish you know these three guys were heavy drug users in any case taking pretty much whatever they could get their hands on so is it really that strange that Tate was found with that combination of drugs in his bloodstream but then when you tie it into certain other events such as the potential unrest between Tucker and Tate leading up to the murders and the fact that Tucker and Rolf had killed Kevin Whitaker just a year earlier via a similar method it did make me wonder if there was something more to this now many of you watching this video will have seen the films, the Rise of the Foot Soldier films etc etc where Tucker and Tate are portrayed almost as brothers. But when we take a look at the official statements surrounding this case it appears that shortly before the murders there was a lot more going on than what is actually portrayed in these films. Just to give you a brief overview of some of the things that I've discussed in previous videos we had the situation with Tate being recalled to prison after the shooting incident we had Tucker going round to Tate's friend to try and collect the money on a car that Tate was selling whilst he was in prison. We had Tucker's purchasing of this brand new house, Tate being concerned where he got the money for this house from. 
we had um, at one point in time Tucker dealing with Tate's then long-term girlfriend Sarah Saunders and paying her a salary every month whilst Tate was in prison and Tate seemingly had a change of heart whilst in prison and took that responsibility from Tony Tucker and gave it to Michael Steele. So there was certainly a level of distrust there between Tucker and Tate, particularly near the end. We also have the following statement, which is from Donna Garwood's brother. Now, Donna Garwood was the then girlfriend of Tony Tucker, and her brother mentions the following in his statement. I remember Donna told me once that Pat Tate had come out of prison. She said, he's only been out five weeks. She said that since Pat had come out, Tony had become worried about something. He had taken a bit of a low profile. He wasn't himself. Donna said he started staying in with her a lot, and Tony was a bit jumpy. Donna said she thought Pat had done something which reflected on Tony, but she didn't say what. Now, obviously, that statement is quite vague in places, and it does leave a lot to the imagination. But one thing that is for sure is that when you combine that one with Barry Dorman's statements, the car dealer who was Pat Tate's friend, where he talks about Tucker turning up on the forecourt and demanding the money for the car, which was sold on Tate's behalf, and Tate calling Barry Dorman from prison and saying, under no circumstances, give the money to anybody else. Make sure you keep it until I come out. Don't give it to Tony. Don't give it to anybody. And yet Tucker was turning up there to try and get hold of that money. There's something not quite right there between that relationship with Tucker and Tate leading up to their murders. Let's take a look back at Barry Dorman's statement from the 8th of December 1995, where it states the following. I did not go and see Pat in prison, but I was asked by Pat through Sarah Saunders to dispose of his current vehicle, which was a black 928 S2 Porsche. I took possession of the vehicle from Sarah, and after having some work done on it, I put it up for sale on my front for around £8,995. When I had the car, I received a phone call from Pat in prison telling me to keep the money if I sold the car and not to give it to Sarah or anyone else. I had the vehicle for a couple of months, and during this time I took two deposits on the car, but the sales fell through. When I took the deposits, I used to put a sold sign on the vehicle, and when I did this, I received a visit from the man called Tony Tucker. At this time, I think I'd met Tucker once or twice when he had attended the car front with Pat before he was returned to prison. When he came to my garage, Tucker told me to give him the money whilst Pat was in prison. Although I had heard about Tony Tucker and I did not want to cross him, I was more concerned about crossing Pat, and therefore I told Tony I would not give him the money. When I stood my ground, I told him what Pat had said, Tony seemed to accept it and left my garage. I kept the car for a couple of months but could not sell it. I therefore returned it to Sarah Saunders. In this time I only saw Tony Tucker once more, when he came up to my car front on a horse and asked me if I had any luck selling it. At this time I had become aware of Tony moving into a house in Fobbing High Road with a large plot of land. I had a couple of phone calls from Pat whilst he was in prison but they appeared to be merely for a chat rather than anything specific. The next time I saw Pat was when he came down to my car front after he had been released from prison. And then as I touched upon earlier, we had the situation with Sarah Saunders whilst Pat was in prison. Now she was being paid X amount of money to keep her going whilst Pat was inside. Originally that job was given to Tony Tucker, it was his responsibility. But somewhere down the line, Michael Steele, I believe, got called to the prison for a meeting with Pat or a conversation with Pat where he said that he no longer trusted Tony, didn't know what he was doing with the money, he wasn't quite sure where the money was going and whether Sarah was getting it or something along those lines. So he decided to give that responsibility to Michael Steele. So regardless, there was a level there of distrust between Tucker and Tate. And when we go back to that statement from Donna Garwood's brother, what exactly does he mean there or did she mean when she said that Tucker was concerned that Tate had done something which reflected on him. What exactly is being spoken about there? Now throughout my time making videos on the Essex Boys case I've heard a lot of rumours. I've had people coming forward saying they know things etc etc and one of the ones that sticks in my mind is the fact that Tate was supposedly going to be drugged up and given over to someone else. Now does that tie in with the sightings of the white vehicle that were seen following the Range Rover or the Range Rover following that white vehicle turning into White House Farm. 
just before they were supposedly killed. Does that tie in somewhere with that white vehicle that Tate was somehow rendered unconscious and he was going to be given over to someone else? Was that part of the plan? We know that Tucker and Rolf had done something similar before with Kevin Whitaker. But I guess the biggest sort of red flag for me personally that this could have some sort of, I don't know, credibility is the fact of these phone calls. And this is something I've touched upon in previous videos. I can't get my head around the fact that it's Tony Tucker who is speaking to this whoever it was at the Sorrel Horse Inn. Now we're always told that it was Tate that was, you know, the catalyst. Tate was the person who was the marked man in all of this. He was the catalyst for these murders. So why was it Tucker that was receiving the call to supposedly arrange the meet for that evening? Now some people will say that Tate was with Tucker on Timberlog Lane at that payphone when the meeting was arranged. But there's something that I'd missed even after looking into this case for the last couple of years. Something that I've overlooked which was just staring me in the face the whole time to be perfectly honest. When we take a look at the phone records there is something which gives a great deal of credibility to the fact that Tucker and Tate were most definitely in two separate places when the meeting was arranged. If we take a look at the phone log here, 1423. Tate's landline, Tate's home address to Tucker's mobile, 1423. Then at 1429, the payphone at the Sorrel Horse Inn calls Tucker's mobile. Now this is the call which is supposedly to arrange the meet for later that evening, the one which they are later killed. Then we have 1432, again the payphone at the Sorrel Horse Inn to the payphone on Timberlog Lane. So at 1423, Tate is most likely at his home address, phoning Tucker's mobile. Then that payphone at the Sorrel Horse Inn contacts Tucker's mobile, and then the telephone on Timberlog Lane. Now we know that Tucker was on Timberlog Lane because he was settling up a bill at a carpet shop on that very same road. So if Tate was the catalyst, then why is Tucker doing all of the arranging? Why is he the person that is arranging the meet for later that evening? Why are they trying to contact Tony Tucker. Is this because Tucker and Rolf were going to hand Tate over to somebody else? Was this a double cross which went horribly wrong? I think to summarise, without seeing a full toxicology report and looking at the levels of the drugs found in Tate's system, it's quite difficult to make any real sort of assumption as to whether he was intentionally overdosed or whether this was simply three individuals who like to take every drug under the sun. Could this have been a double cross which went wrong, as I just said earlier? Was it Tucker's job to get Tate down the lane for someone else to be collected? Or was this simply just three people who like to dabble in whatever drug they could find? Many thanks for joining me for this video. Very shortly you'll be able to see some other videos from the channel, including the Essex Boys playlist, which has all of the videos concerning this case in one convenient folder. If you like this video, please do give it a thumbs up. If you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing. I look forward to seeing you all again in the next video. Take care. Cheers.